hardest part is figuring out what you want to master. Focus on your product. Can you tell somebody that they suck? You gotta just go for This is exactly what I want to do for a living. You can't even tell somebody that their breath is fit for life. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We are joined uh, by a very special guest and a another. All my listeners know how much I love fellow podcasters because this just makes my job so incredibly easy. Uh, but Kyle Kingsbury from uh, On It, from a million other things that we'll get into. Uh, thanks for coming on and doing this, man. Yeah, thank you, brother. Thanks I for really having appreciate me. It. I'm looking forward to. Uh, you're one of the people that I just know is like we talked about before this. Like you just have a bunch of knowledge and a bunch of useful information and a cool story to go along with it. And I think that like, I don't know, I'm just looking for, I love any time when I can, I'm kind of outside of my zone uh, with this human optimization stuff. And I love when I can just kind of be dumb and soak up information. And a lot of my listeners can too. So I'm excited. Hell yeah, brother. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so like I told you, like I usually on here like to get people's stories first and find out how you even got into doing what you're doing right now so where are you you're from california yeah i'm from northern california cupertino mm -hmm. sunnyville near san jose and, and didn't uh, uh didn't get sucked into the tech industry huh no but that drove me the fuck out you, you did know? it like if you if you're if you're trying to live there now and you're not in tech i mean you got no business being in yeah. the silicon valley that's what it's i picked too expensive and I'm a little bit like, uh, I don't know, bias or whatever, because I've never really spent much time there. But every time I see Cupertino, I just imagine like everyone's developing the next iPhone. Well, it's just, it's ridiculous. Like my mom still has a house out there and she's in real estate, so she's, she's safe. Yeah. But it's not a... Uh, it's just skyrocketing, right? Is it outrageous. constantly going up? Yeah. I mean, they're opening the new Apple building not far from where my mom lives and that's good for her. Yeah. But I mean, for anybody else trying to buy a home. Screw it. Yeah, you're fucked. Oh, man. And so what was it like when you were growing up? Oh, it was pretty, I mean, it was different for sure. We had, I think, 70% Asians in my high school. Mm -hmm. It's like a lot of my friends growing up, like some of my best friends to this day are Asian. Mm -hmm. That's different being a minority mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. But I mean, as a white person, as a white male. Yeah. Um, but like not a big deal, you know, like obviously near San Francisco, it's a different vibe. You know, like yeah. people are cool. I never had an issue with, with uh, your choice of who to love, shit like yeah, that. You yeah. know, like it's just different there. Yeah. So... Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about that. It's funny because as I get into these more, like I get that different. You know, I'm from Akron, Ohio, which is a pretty small town. And it's not like crazy, like, you know, uh, I don't know what the word is, but like a Mississippi, what I picture like Mississippi being or something like that. But like it is pretty like, you know, gay. You don't talk about gay stuff. It's not very diverse. Um, and I just think that like when I remember when I first moved to L.A., I was like, this is crazy. Like, it just felt like, whoa, like, I like it. I'm into mm -hmm. it. But it felt like super overwhelming. You know what I mean? I guess growing up in an area like that would just kind of seed you with a little bit broader, like, acceptance of everything and everyone, you know? Yeah, it is different. It's funny. My brother and my sister married uh, an American whose parents are from Thailand. Uh -huh. So he's Thai. And, like, he's never experienced that. He went to another high school right next to mine that's, you know, pr primarily Asian and uh, they were up in Washington, and not that Washington, I'm not saying anywhere in this country is <laughs> known for being racist. I try to be but, careful, too. Yeah, I'm not trying to burn Washington. <laughs> yep. But they got out, you know, in a smaller town, and everyone was staring at him. And he was yeah. like, why is everyone fucking looking at us? And yeah. my sister was like, because you're Asian. That's and he was cool. like, oh, shit. Like, he had never experienced that, Yeah, you know, being in the Bay. Yeah. So weird how you just go a short distance. Mm -hmm. a very different perception. And still on the West Coast, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Interesting. Um, what about like, where were you into? Did you, were you into sports super early? I played, I started playing football at 10, got into wrestling in junior high and high school yep. and yep. Um, finished up playing football at Arizona State. I sucked in college, you know, I set the bench, but I still really? wanted that, that feel, you know, like a human interaction. I felt kind of like a, a rat on the wheel, on the treadmill, training myself when I finished football. And yeah. Pretty depressing time in my life, not knowing what to do and got into mixed martial arts and everything kind of took off from there. Yeah. Were you, were you good at football in high school? Yeah, I was good in high school, good in junior college, yep. you know, all-star teams, all that shit. And wrestling, too? Pretty good in wrestling, but I wrestled up. We had another guy on the team that was close to the same size. He always beat me in wrestle-offs, Yeah. so I had to wrestle up at heavyweight. Yeah. And what happens, like, the transition to college, this will show you how much I really know about, like, sports, but what happens? Like, it's just a different—why were you so good in high school and then had trouble in college? 
I think I was decent in college, but as a walk on, it's different. You know, yeah. like they want to give guys that are that are on scholarship a chance to play. And and in, you know, by no means am I saying I should have started. The guys that started went pro. Yeah. But I watched guys that had played every game all four years not make it to the NFL. So yep. that jump is significant from high school to college, and then the jump from college to NFL is is it's massive. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then what about general like? Um, I always try to wrap my head around like parenting style were you getting do you get in any trouble growing up like yes <laughs> <laughs> understatement uh i fought a lot growing up you know and that wasn't a determining factor to fight professionally yeah it's a different story you know when your back's against the wall and you gotta you gotta kick some ass i always loved that like i felt in control and just fucking in the moment like yeah. you know same things that i read in spiritual texts like 100 percent presence yeah. no worry no fear and those were the times where I felt most alive, you really? know, so I really enjoyed that growing up and gravitated towards it. My parents fought quite a bit, so I definitely had uh, an itch to scratch yeah. when it came with that, you know. And what do you think fueled it? Like, was it just that you gen generally enjoyed, genuinely enjoyed fighting? Yeah, and you know, the Bay Area was kind of a, it's a hard spot, you know, yeah. it's not like you, I think, I can't, I forget the name, they, they, they call it a melting pot sometimes, mm -hmm. right? It's not a fucking melting pot. It's a salad bowl. Like there's no, people don't integrate in. Yeah. You got pockets of one group, pockets of yeah. a different group, and it wasn't a race thing. It was just, um, you know, kids grow up, grow up hard. There's very wealthy areas in the Bay, and there's you know East Side San Jose, East Palo Alto, and mm -hmm. and that's changing quite a bit. But there was still a lot of kids that wanted to tear shit up. Yeah. Um, and how did your parents react to that? Like, did they? get super upset when you got in trouble or did they just kind of let you do your thing or? no they got you know they definitely got upset they paid attention um the rule of thumb was i can't start a fight don't bully people yeah. but if you know somebody starts to fight with you you can defend yourself i think they got more pissed off how many times i go to the principal's office for being a clown yeah you know, like he, class clowning disruptive behavior things like that that was pretty common too so um I think they had a real issue with that, you know. Yeah. And looking, I would as a parent now. That's I'd have a big problem with my son doing that too. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny how that perspective changes. It would just be so annoying, you know. Like if he was like, "Hey, your son's," <laughs> like, like, "Come on." Yeah, man. you get called again by the principal. Yeah, Fuck. Like, what's wrong? Yeah, like, I feel like fighting's almost better. You know, it's yeah. like at least you're like defending yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like, come on, man, chill out. Um, and then what about socially? Like, were you? Were you popular? Did you get along with people well? I think so. I had a lot of friends, you know, growing up, and yeah. it was always easy for me to make friends. I think that, um, I don't know, you know, it was, it was uh, I didn't have issues that, with that. Yeah. You know, it felt good, yeah. and I liked that. I just didn't always vibe with my teachers. There was a lot of the course material that I thought was complete bullshit. Yeah. Kids can see the writing on the wall, you know, like you know what you're going to use in life, you know if it's important or not, and there's quite a bit of stuff that we force feed our kids to learn that's just, it's worthless information. That's why I can't imagine what's going on right now, right? Like, I'd love to see what they're teaching in school, but I'm guessing that it's not that much different than what we learned in basic high school, right? Yeah, well, there are, there are and I've looked into this, um, you know, Rudolf Steiner was a really intelligent guy. He started the Waldorf school, and I'm not, for everybody that's like, oh, Waldorf's bullshit. It's just one possible difference, yeah. right? It's not, I'm not saying my son's going to go to Waldorf, but they teach differently. One of the things they do is they allow you to proceed faster at things that you're good at. Yeah. So if you excel in math, you can ball out in math and take college level courses by the time you're a senior or a junior. Yeah. And if you suck in history or some other course, all they make you do is finish the minimums. Yeah, that's cool. You know, so you can accelerate, you know, on the path that you yeah. want to do. And but that's, that's that specific like tailored school. Yeah. And like there's, in normal, there's others like, like in, that. But do you think that in like normal, like normal, back in Akron, Ohio, they're teaching this pretty much the same thing, right? Same bullshit, yeah. Which is what's crazy is I feel like now I was, I was zoned out then. So now with social media, you know what I mean? Like all the other shit that's going on. I think they have a bit more computer science classes, but yeah. probably the bulk of it is the same. I think that's why people love podcasts so much, which is great for Instant us. information. Yeah. It's yeah like, oh, this is the real information. Uh -huh. like they're not teaching this in our yep. chemistry class. Yeah. Um, and then what about, did you go to college with any uh, goals or, or was it more driven uh, by sports? I wanted to play football and yeah. you know it's funny because the goals change over time in order to stay eligible i had to keep taking the easy classes yeah. so uh business major becomes communications major becomes bachelor of interdisciplinary studies which is like two i two minors to equal one major yeah. it's a fucking basket weaving degree yeah. you know and i didn't know what i was going to do with that and by the time i was a senior there's so many courses on 
like they are BIS courses on how to sell yourself in, uh, uh, you know, an interview. Like yep. you're, you're going in for your job interview. This is why you're going to tell them why your degree is actually worth the shit. And it would just, it made zero sense to me. Like, yeah. I don't want a fucking desk job. I don't want to do any of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so what happened, like, so then if, if in college you're uh, not playing that much football, you kind of go for a degree that you couldn't give a shit less about, is it's after college when you said, like, you started to get kind of depressed and wonder, like, what the hell's going on? Yeah, I quit, quit going my senior year after football. And I got right. really depressed, got into a lot of pills. Um, it was a hard time because I didn't, you know, really when I look back, there was a lot of stuff I had, had not unpacked from my childhood and I didn't have any tools. Yep. Like I didn't have meditation, breath work, a lot of the stuff that we'll talk about today. Yep. And um, I just felt fucking lost. Like yeah. it wasn't going to get any better, you know? And then. Um, Can you tell me what that looked like? Like what sort of like what were you actually doing on a daily basis what type of pills were you taking like what did yeah that look man like? we can dive into that let's see you know I, i'd go out on the weekends uh do a lot of ecstasy a lot of coke a lot of drinking um xanax and valium to fall asleep mm -hmm. pain pills sometimes during the day i had a doctor that gave me everything xanax really? valium vicodin whatever i wanted sell some of it on the side yeah. uh, to pay for ecstasy and blow <laughs> yeah. um and you, you know, now that I understand the brain better, and obviously I've taken a deeper into the a deeper dive into that because of fighting and because of getting hit in the head as often as I yeah, did. Yeah. Um, I want to learn how to heal that. But you know, at that time, you know, looking back in hindsight, like I was on a fucking roller coaster yeah. emotionally. Yeah. You know, just jacked to the gills on uppers and slowing everything down at night to try to get some shitty sleep at five a.m. Yeah, yeah. And do you attribute that the most, like you said, to stuff left over from childhood as well as just generally kind of being lost of, with direction yeah we want meaning we want purpose yep. you know if we don't have that um you want to fill the void but people do that with anything it doesn't have to be pills i mean i know there's close family members of mine that will watch every shitty tv show on television yep. like the fucking worst stuff just to distract themselves yeah and they'll fall asleep with the tv on yeah you know like it's always on uh, every movie known to man has been seen yeah uh, things like yeah. that you know and it's like that's a distraction shopping is a distraction all these things all these forms of addiction are ways that we can draw ourselves away from ourselves so we don't pay attention to what's going on inside yeah how long did that period last mm, i'd say you know it it really spiraled for about a year uh -huh. and uh i talked about this on the solo podcast that i did on the on it podcast but ultimately i tried to kill myself really so i you know went to i took every pill that i had thankfully there was only about 10 or 15 left of the xanax volume bike yeah. it in yeah crammed them all down and drove to uh the top of a parking structure at asu and went to jump off and a security guard saw me driving up there it was really late at night so we obviously knew something was weird going on followed me up there and when i got to the top I wasn't very spiritual. I'd been to church, didn't think much of it. And this deep sense of calm came over me. Mm -hmm. And I, it might have been the medication actually working. It mm -hmm. might have just been, um, I mean, in my opinion, it was this this thing saying, like, whatever's something bigger than me, just saying, like, hey, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And I just fucking started crying and realized, all right, not yet. I'm going to live. Not yet. And, and what does so, the security guard do? He's like, hey, dude, <laughs> please come back down. <laughs> you know, oh, you like, were like climbed up on something? I was on top of it about to jump off naked. Jesus. Naked? Naked. And, uh, you know, he talked me back down. I kind of snapped out of it a day and a half later in a hospital. My family was there. They all flew out to Arizona from California. And, um, you know, my mom calls it the loony bin. I was stuck in the loony bin yeah. for about a week. Yeah. And everybody there is like, what are you fucking doing here? Like, your family's here. People love you. You look good. Yeah. You're an athlete, you know, and um it's 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 a funny thing though because that perspective isn't there it yeah. doesn't matter when you're in pain and there and you don't see the way out of that yeah it doesn't fucking matter what people say like oh you got everything going like no 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 like you don't understand yeah you know only you understand that pain and um yeah that's why when people like i understand the different perspectives but like when people do commit suicide and people say oh that's so selfish that's so selfish and i get it is really selfish but the problem is you have to think about what could even get a person to that point. They truly believe that their kids, their mom, their dad, it, it just doesn't matter. It just mm -hmm. doesn't matter. They don't matter to them. They don't, it just, you have to understand like nobody is about to do that and thinks like, ah, screw my kids. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you just you're in such a dark place that none of that makes sense. Yeah. And then a lot of times the the reasoning is that, you know, when it comes to other people that are close to you, like they're better off without me. Yeah. You know, that thought process is real. Yeah. Did that is that what pulled you out of it or did it take I got out of that, you know, and they wanted to put me on SSRIs and lithium and a bunch of weird shit. And I had taken I mean you know, I always get grief when I say this stuff because I know that there are certain people where that, that's helped a lot. Yep. So I have to say that. Um, and I know a guy that lithium has helped a lot. But to me, it made me feel like a mute. Mm -hmm. There was no high. There was no low. I was fucking flatlined. Yep. And I said, I don't want any of this shit. And um, jumped off everything and started paying attention a bit more to my daily routine. You know, like I, and I didn't realize I was doing it. I just wanted to be outside more. I wanted to take care of myself a little bit more and go to bed on time. And um, I had this this inclination, like I need to be around people. And yeah. I need, and I know I was missing that from football. So why don't I at least train in mixed martial arts Yeah, just to be around people, just to have the human interaction. Yep. And that really helped, you know, it was a big thing for me. And it was only probably three months into that where somebody's like, dude, you played football at ASU, you're big. Why don't you fight heavyweight for me? And uh, if you like it, you can keep going. If you don't like it, you don't have to do ever do it again. And yeah. I was like, all right, you know, I'll give it a shot. And I won my first two fights in under 30 seconds. And from there, I was like, all right, fuck, let's do it. Let's That'll see how far it. we can go. Yeah. You know? Yeah, what I love about it too is it, it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like it's kind of like, sure, you had this moment, but it was like a slow dig out of that phase, right? Yeah. You know, I think that a lot of people like, and some people have these moments, but like, you know, they kind of hope for, this moment that's just going to change your life and make you see the light and from that moment i was changed and it's like sure you might notice in one moment like hey i'm going too far here or whatever but like i just love the like slow i i was similar and went through a similar phase it didn't go that far but felt very similar and to me it was what it took to get to positive was literally just Starting by going for walks around the block, then seeing if I could jog around the block, then going with a friend to a soul cycle class, then reading a book, then reading two books, you know what I mean? Then figuring out what meditation was. Then, and it was such a slow thing that I feel like even today, just my natural personality, like I have to constantly keep moving or else I know that that exists somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. But that's the beauty of it. You know, everything snowballs. Mm -hmm. So like which direction are you heading? Are you making progress? Are you... And, and everybody thinks, you know, especially in the West, we think about progress as financial gain mm -hmm. or more things or more followers. financial freedom. Yeah, more followers, <laughs> more likes, yeah. you know, that kind of shit. Yeah. And, it's, and it's about, like, what are you doing for yourself? Mm -hmm. You know, like, the financial piece is an important piece of it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's really what are you doing that builds you up, that, that fulfills you in life, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that really makes you more whole, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of each day. And I think MMA was the first catalyst for that. And obviously, you know, having started my fight career the way that I did, like it hooked me in. Mm -hmm. And I realized, you know, I was still distracting myself with video games. Like in between training, I was just playing video games and hanging with mm -hmm. friends and drinking still. And mm -hmm. um, at a certain point, I realized that if I'm not doing something for recovery, like massage, stretching, yoga, uh, I should be reading. I should be learning more about the things that will actually propel me further. Yeah. And at some point video games were out and I used to play Madden like 12 hours a day yeah. in college, yeah. you know? So like that was a big shift for me too. But yeah. those were all the things, you know, like in fighting, I read more books on health and wellness, diet, nutrition, mobility, recovery, uh, biohacks and supplements, you know, far more than I ever did in college. Yeah. That's funny, man, how that works. I just, there's such a, there's such a like reoccurring theme of this with people that are high achievers like of a, it just makes me wish that there was a different schooling or a different you know what i mean like you see the same errors go wrong time and time again and it's like man i just i don't know um so then what how did your fighting career progress you were on uh, ultimate fighter yeah i fought in rage in the cage got to five and oh fought in king of the cage a few times uh lost my first fight there and you know being from the bay area I trained a little bit about at uh, American Kickboxing Academy when mm -hmm. I was in high school, and they had blown up. I mean, uh, a lot of guys that I, when I was at playing football at ASU, a lot of guys that were on the wrestling team ended up fighting in the UFC. Mm -hmm. Ryan Bader, C.B. Dalloway, 
and Cain Velasquez. And Cain was at AKA. Mm-hmm. He, he wrestled heavyweight at ASU. And uh, my old strength coach, who's a savage, he's a um, big house, Joe Ken. He, he's the head coach of the Carolina Panthers now for their strength program. Uh-huh. He was like, Kingsbury, you got to go to AKA. Fuck all these other places. Go to AKA, train with Kane. Uh-huh. I was like, all right, cool, man. I can move back in with my family, you know, because you're not getting paid much as a fighter. Yeah. And, uh, and at least train there, be around good guys. And that's where things kind of took off. You know, I got on the Ultimate Fighter. That was my doorway into the UFC. Uh-huh. And um, everything progressed, you know. And certainly it was like a story of peaks and valleys. Yeah. You know, I lost my first fight coming in, won four in a row, had uh, two fight of the nights and, a, and a, like a 30-second knockout, and then lost four in a row on, on my way out. Really? Yeah. So <laughs> it was highs and lows for sure. It is just like from my perspective, UFC is just like – did you love it from the beginning? Like I know, like there's insanely hard work and and that, but like the actual act of being in a cage and like, all right, man, it's me versus you. Like, did you like that environment sort of from the beginning, or did you have to learn to love it? Like, what was that like? I had to learn it through sparring, you know. And then really, that's one of the biggest tools that I've got on um, facing fear and yeah. and mentality and things like that. And it's funny because there's books that I'd read in the past that talked about breath work and different forms of meditation and i was like fuck off i don't need to read that part tell me about the diet or tell me about the the weight training you know and um i ended up getting a sports psychologist who worked with me on different breath work so i could shift from sympathetic which is your fight or flight mental state into parasympathetic rest and digest calming and if i could do that in between rounds then i could recover quicker and be a better fighter you know and like bruce lee says you don't want to fight angry you want to be just dialed in at that zero state no mind where everything's reflex and you're you um you fight better that way. Yeah. So training that through time, that the, all those things were, I was able to to extrapolate out and draw that out and take it into the real world. Yeah. You know. Did you have to do a lot of work on like reading about fear management and stuff like that, mindset and stuff like that, or more? I mean, I did, but I mean, I just there were certain things that stuck to me. Like I think a great book is, uh, and I started with The Power of Now, but I think A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle yeah. is is one of my all time favorites. Yeah. You know, and I and I just think. Those things paired well with fighting, but really it was about the practices of being comfortable getting hit in the face yeah. and then also knowing, like, I can shut out everything else because I'm a guy that feeds off the crowd, yeah. you know, but if I'm getting my ass beat, that works the wrong direction yeah. too, you know, yeah. so really just being able to be present, knowing, like, if I'm in a shitty position, I need to focus on just the things that I can control, yeah. you know, and that's true with life. Yeah. If you're in a bad spot, Start where you are, do what you can with what you have, right? Yeah. Like, I love that that quote. Yeah, You just do it. That's yeah. it. That's so good. And then why, when it finally came time to wrap it up, was that just because you were over it? Or, like, what was that feeling? Of there, was a lot, there was a lot that went into that. Yeah. You know, I mentioned we don't get paid well. Yep. Uh, I was still living in mom's garage. I'd been living in my mom's garage for, like, five years. Yep. And I kind of saw the writing on the wall. Um, but in that time, you know, I had, I'd had an injury in 2020, 2012, or 2012, 2020, 2012, 2012, <laughs> where um, I fought Nottingham and the whole left side of my face got smashed in the second time. So second time I've had my orbital blown out with my left eye. Ugh. Left eyebrow is also fractured. And in training, after my eye healed, I tore my right labrum in my shoulder, uh-huh. which was way worse than I thought. Like it was a year off just uh-huh. getting that back. Uh-huh. And at the same time, I had a coach, a boxing coach, who's part Native American, who would take me to the reservation and do like plant medicine ceremonies uh-huh. with me. Uh-huh. And that was my first intro into what I would call good drugs. Uh-huh. You know, they're still drugs, yeah. but I mean, I had done mushrooms before that, not in a ceremonial way, um, certainly not with intention and, and like w- having some sort of spiritual layer to that, yep. you know, and that really, that became important to me. And it became so important to me, especially when I started working with ayahuasca, that fighting kind of faded Mm -hmm. and i still wanted to fight like all right i have all the tools now let me see if i can put this into practice because there is no greater test than the fight yeah you know like can you remain calm in the fire that's the test to do it in and so i wanted to fight one more time and got my ass beat in my last fight and uh i was like all right you know i I I kind of realized the mid fight like i don't want to do this again yeah it's not important anymore you know so where do you go from there like, where do you go from having this sort of, like, you know, bit of a change happen, knowing that you didn't want to fight anymore? Like, what do you, what, is, what do? you do? Well, I, I kept reading, you know? I kept reading because I was still 
thirsty for that knowledge and I knew that it served me well. Yeah. Like I, and even though I'd retired and didn't know what I was going to be when I grew up, I loved, I loved the shit that I was learning. You why know, didn't I, it, to, I guess, sorry, what I was trying to wrap my head around is like, why didn't it mess you up the second time? Oh, without having a future of knowledge? Well, yeah, that I was, was just scared. in That's, a better, I mean, my yeah. mindset after ayahuasca was so much deeper and connected and um, I didn't feel alone. I felt like I had answers. And if there was, if I had deep questions that I didn't have the answer to, I knew that I had a catalyst for those answers. Yeah. That I could take those questions into an ayahuasca ceremony and get everything and then some. Yeah. You know, all my questions would be answered and more. You know, and that's that's certainly been the case for me with that medicine in particular. Yeah. What is that experience like? It's uh, it's difficult. It's. <laughs> Um, it scares me. You know, they I, have to, I look at it and I'm like, I want to <laughs> do that so bad, but it's like, fuck, it's so scary. Yeah, my wife kind of had that. She's done it with me 12 times. The first time she didn't want to do it. Yeah. She was like, I don't want to fucking puke and shit my pants and cry. You know, and, yeah. Yeah, and cry and people are just wailing. It sounds like you're in a war zone. Yeah. And uh, I was like, no, you know, it's going to be beautiful. And I had read trip reports and, um, you know, where people go into great detail about their experience. And I was like, this sounds incredible yeah. you know this sounds like mushrooms magnified and it's it's guided you have a shaman there uh when you're in a tight spot they can work with you to kind of guide you out of that yeah and my experiences were incredible um i mean the first time i came back after that solo ceremony without her i couldn't talk about it without just bawling for two weeks really it touched me that much like it changed my life is it know? possible to even explain like what you yeah my very first vision so like you have visions like you, like a uh, it's DMT is a part of ayahuasca Got and it. most brews, and um, you kind of slip into this dream state, but you're not in a movie, and you know when, when a scientist would describe it a hallucinogen, it's like you're seeing this fake thing that's not real, yeah. it doesn't exist. But in the experience, it's the realest thing you've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. Like it's the most touching, most meaningful, and and dialed in for you. You know, like it, it was it was very meaningful for me. But my first vision that I ever had was um, I became my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, and I relived every argument we had ever had. Really? And it was like, like from her time perspective. Lapse, but I was her, and I was yelling at Kyle in a way that Kyle would understand it. And when I came out of that, I mean, just fucking waterworks. It opened the floodgates. Because I knew she wasn't nagging at me to, you know, I don't want you to go out with your friends or I don't want you to get drunk. She was worried. Like yeah. there was concern because I was still drinking like an asshole at that point yeah. and destroying myself unknowingly, yeah. you know? And so coming out of that, it really, it's a, it shifted my perspective so far that I knew how much she cared about me. I knew she loved me. You know, my yeah. very next vision, the same ceremony, I became my mom and I watched my stomach grow with Kyle inside. Uh -huh. And I could feel the nervousness of being a mom for the first time. Uh -huh. Like, just wanting to do the best you possibly can as a mother. Yeah. And every time my husband Rick, Kyle's dad, would come over and touch the belly and kiss the belly, I could feel it fucking beam in this energy to Kyle and come back out. I could feel it as her, as the mom, and I could feel it touching this child growing inside me. It was fucking insane. Oh, man. And then when you come out of it, like it sticks. Yeah. Like it's like it really I'll, happened. I'll never forget that. It yeah. is like it really happened and, and quite meaningful. And it changed my relationship with my mother. Yeah. You know, like you don't, who is it? Uh, Ram Dass says like, anytime you think you have enlightenment, go and spend a week with your parents. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's a fuck deal. Cause you have so much history and there's so much trauma there and there's so much shit that you got to work through. But ultimately for me, that was like, your parents will tell you, you'll never know what it's like till you have kids of your own. Yep. And I didn't have a kid at that point, but I understood then how much they cared about me, yep. you know? And do you, um, so like, is it one of those situations where you leave and you like call your mom? And you're like, mom, I don't know where to start here, but like, yeah. I love you. She knew I was going and, uh, and I couldn't talk to her about it without crying yeah. for weeks, Yeah, you know? Oh, how amazing. It blew her away. And the other thing is like, do you, because you've done it a bunch, right? Yeah, I've done it 22 times now. Jesus. And do you have to, does the feeling sort of fade and you have to re-up? Or like, what's the reason for going? Is it for, for going back? Like well, a renewal? The, I, I mean, you know, I've seen a lot of people come often and it looks like they're in the same fucking place mentally and emotionally. Yeah. You know, like they don't, they're not graduating to the next level. And I had had that where I went three months in a row and I kept being told to meditate and do yoga. 
Uh-huh. Like it was tell that was my message in, and the, I, the, in, the, in experience. the in the experience. And yeah. like third time it happens, I'm like, why the fuck do you keep telling me this? And it was like you haven't done it, yeah. and you're not getting any new information until you do. Yeah. And so that was my like fire in the ass to actually start meditating, to learn about it, start doing yoga, opening up my body, and um, and that's not the message for everyone. You know, like yeah. that's something that's kind of. Not everybody will say this, but I think it's important to state like whatever, it's like the oracle in the matrix. Mm -hmm. Whatever the message is, that's your message. You know, sometimes people come out of that and they're like, we need to stop using paper. We need to stop doing this. We need to, you know, and it's like, hey, that message is for you, buddy. (laughs) You know, like that's what it's telling you. (laughs) You need to stop using paper. We all should meditate. Like, (laughs) no, that was my message, you know? And when I started doing that, I got new information. So the draw, I mean, there's different parts, times in your life where you are drawn to it. You know, certainly when, the shit hits the fan and there's a lot to think about and process. Yeah. I think that's a good time yeah. for me to go. But there's been other times where it's just, hey, it's been a while and I feel called to do this. Yep. And uh, those have been powerful experiences too. Oh, how interesting. You make it sound so like appealing. You know what I mean? <laughs> when you talk about it, I'm like, I gotta go. Hey, Gabor Mate's done it a hundred times. I don't know if you're f- familiar with him. No. He's an amazing guy, uh, psychotherapist from Canada, works primarily on addiction. Uh-huh. And um, he's done many, many ceremonies. And uh, he says he still gets nervous every time, really? you know, but there's that level of respect that you have to have, yeah. you know, it's not, it's not something you play with. It's not recreational by any means. Yeah. And it, it requires a lot of work, you know? Yeah. Oh, how amazing. So where do you go from there? Like, so you've had this experience, you've had this eye opening thing, you're done fighting, but you don't feel that same like sense of emptiness or loss, but like, wh- where do you, what's the next step? Well, one of the things that it gave me was, you know, trust, like trust, mm-hmm. everything's going to work out. Just stick to the course, you know, continue to do what you love mm-hmm. and be passionate about it. And I was working at, you know, the whole time I was fighting, I was working as a bouncer and bartender at like a pseudo strip club, mm-hmm. like a bikini bar. Mm-hmm. And um, not a great environment, but ultimately it was awesome. It put yeah. food on the table for my wife and I and, uh, and my son when we had him. And um, just kept going. And then I got on Joe Rogan's podcast mm-hmm. like two and a half years ago and uh you know, we had a really great time, did a good job on the show. And he was like, you need to fucking start a podcast. And I was like, yeah, I know you tell that to everybody, <laughs> yeah. but he's like, no, I'm dead serious. Like seriously fucking start a podcast. Yeah. And, uh, so I started a podcast and ended up, um, working with a company that, uh, paid, paid me to be full time, really? you know, and then shit just took off from there. What was your podcast about? Like when you got started, cause I know a lot of my listeners are like, oh, I want to start one. But what what was it about? What did you? Talk I wanted about? to talk about everything that kind of moved the needle for me. Mm-hmm. So that was there was you know I interviewed Rick Doblin, the head of Maps, who's okay. working right now with um, MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD and different things like that. He yep. wants to have it legal in 2022. Yeah, and um, you know also people in the health and wellness field, people um, that were dialed in with meditation, like any practice that had really helped me in life. Yeah, whether that was physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual, I wanted people to hear about that. Yep. Yep. And um. You know, meeting Aubrey at Paleo FX a year ago, that was the next big transition for me. Mm-hmm. You know, everything kind of fell in place for me to take the job with On It, and uh, I had been a can huge. Can you tell that story? Yeah, I can tell the story. Yeah. So you're doing this. You're doing this podcast. <laughs> I don't want. I don't want to squeeze the good information out before. The, so um, you're doing this podcast. You have a company paying you well to do it. What well, was the company like? Just so I can understand, like, were they like a supplement company or something? That was no, it's um. And I've mentioned them before, Brain FM. They do uh, binaural beats, which is something that I think yeah. is an, it's an excellent hack for meditation. People that can't sit quietly in a room, they you know you throw on the headphones and it can help dial in different brainwave brainwave states. So like brainwave entrainment is this idea that you know right now we're in a beta wave state, we're high functioning, we're thinking, we're mm-hmm. on the ball. The better we can change that and shift it into an alpha wave state, which might be flow, or theta wave, which might be more meditative. Yeah that's really beneficial for us. Yeah. Even if we're type A and we want to be beta, that'll make our beta better. Yeah. You know, the, the brain needs breaks too. You can't be go, go, go all the time. Yeah. So it was a great, it was a great company. And, um, you know, they just didn't understand, I don't think, how long it was going to take for that podcast to take off. Yeah. You know, they're like, oh, this guy was just on Rogan's. He's going to blow up. He'll yeah. go right back on Rogan's and yeah. he'll blow our company up. And yeah, they, saw, they saw that shit. They didn't see like, it takes years for the podcast to really do well. Yeah and start to build momentum. And um, so, you know, I, I meet Aubrey at Paleo FX and um, we shared the same flight back to Vegas mm-hmm. where I was living with uh, me, Aubrey and John Wolf 
the master trainer. He's he's kind of the coach of all coaches at at on it. Mm -hmm. And um, we're on the flight. We're trading war stories about ayahuasca and plant medicines, uh, fasting, meditation, strength and conditioning, diet, nutrition, everything. Uh -huh. And he was like, "Fuck, dude, I want I want you to work it on it." Uh -huh. And I was like, "I don't know. I got this great thing going." He's yeah. like, "Well, listen, why don't I fly you out?" Uh, you take a look at what the job looks like, and um, if it works out, then we can we can keep talking. Yeah. I was like, cool. So I'm I'm in the airport to fly to Austin for the interview, and Brand FM calls me up, and they're like, yo, we're going to fire you, and we're not going to pay you severance, and you're fucked. So I meditate the entire flight yeah. there to Austin using their product. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> and ironically... <laughs> and I get off the plane, I felt better than before the fucking phone call. Yeah. You know, it was like like meditating with your back against the wall. Like I was I, I knew right then, like one of these things is that that really has helped me in life is this concept of like if you if you have an option of something you can do, yeah. then then that's good. Don't worry about it because you have that thing you can work towards. Mm -hmm. If you have no options and your back's against the wall and you're fucked, then don't worry about it. You've, there's nothing you can fucking do. It's mm -hmm. out of your hands, right? Mm -hmm. So I knew right then, like, there's nothing I can do right now. Potentially, this could lead so to something. But if I show up a piece of shit that's moping around, yeah. that's not good for anybody. Yeah. So I got to be my best self. Yeah. And I showed up as my best self. You know, I had an absolute blast with Aubrey. He showed me everything that I'd be doing it on it. I thought originally it'd just be the podcast and maybe a couple other things. But I got to work in product development on supplements and food products and doing Life Hack of the Week for social media and a bunch of other shit that's... Yeah. It really exceeded expectations, you know. Yeah. And he was like, "When, uh, when do you think you can start?" And I just started laughing. I was like, "Well, uh, two days ago, this shit happened, yeah. and uh, I'm available whenever." <laughs> so, two weeks after that, um, we were in Austin. Man. You know, that's straight up destiny. Hundred percent. That's those, no that, those, mistakes. The magical ayahuasca power you two have just like attracted you to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Pulled in like a fucking tractor beam. Yeah, man. You know. Um, and then was your was your uh sort of responsibilities or whatever similar to what they are now or did you get in there and like really evolve into this this role? i think you know i've i've certainly grown in certain aspects um certain things fell by the wayside you know it's it's all it's fine tuning in any place where yeah. that you go you know but definitely um if i was to say my biggest passions that on it um they're the podcast you know where you get to meet interesting people yeah. and, and learn from them and share that with the world and then of course um, product development. I mean, that tickles a creativity bone that I never had in anything else. You know, yeah. now as the office guinea pig, I'm trying all sorts of cool new shit yeah. that really, really you do that helps with recovery. You yeah, test it. Yeah, I'm testing all this stuff out. And you then ever I, test like too much Alpha Brain, and you're just like, oh, dude. I've, I was talking to Rogan about that. I f I fucked up bad a few times. Did you? Yeah, I showed up to an office meeting with Aubrey and a couple other guys, and I was hurting. I was fucked up. Really? I had about three times too much of this product that lowers blood sugar, and. uh I couldn't talk. He's like, dude, are you, you all right? And I was like, no, no, man, I'm, I'm not doing good. And I was pale as a ghost. I laid down on the couch in his office and fucking full body sweat. I was fucked up for two days. And that doesn't freak you out? Like, if that happened to me, just my personality, I would go into a full bore panic attack. No, like, I knew I'm what dying. it was. I knew I couldn't, have, I knew I wasn't going to die. Yeah. You know, uh, drink more water, that kind of thing. But I kind of want to, you know, I like to experiment with myself and I want to see, you know, all right, if this does this, this dose, then it's like, it's like anything, you yeah. know, like, let me, let me ramp it up a bit and then, yeah. okay, let me scale it back down. All right. This is the sweet spot. Yeah. And, um, you know, being a part of formulations, like you, there's on one hand, we want to know it's science backed, you know, yeah. like we go out to supplement conferences and a lot of companies that are there have brilliant supplements, but they, they don't have the marketing. They can't take that to the masses. So they're looking for a company like ours to do that. Yeah. But we don't want just one thing. So we'll take that and we'll stack it with a couple other awesome things that all pair well, all within the same genre. And you know that, that we'll usually use it at whatever dose range that's at that's scientifically backed. Yeah. But I still want to see yeah. where it push goes the, for me push personally. Push the gas a little. Yeah, I want to push the gas a little bit and see where that goes. <laughs> that's so good. And then as far as the podcast goes, was it a similar approach to what you were doing before, like you wanted to talk to people in that field? Yeah, but it is, it's kind of split now, you know, like Aubrey has his, his brand and podcast. And, um, obviously that's, it's in a different group. Like when I took over total human optimization, that became the on it podcast. I'm allowed to talk about psychedelics. You can talk about anything yeah. there. It's not taboo, which is great. But at the same time, um, 
you know, if we're going to have a guy on like a Rick Doblin, he's going to go on Aubrey's podcast because yeah. Aubrey is philosophy and yeah. he's talking about uh, mindset and spirituality and, and that's really his wheelhouse. Yeah. So, um, but there's there's quite a few guests that we'll have on that go on both shows and we just pick different topics. We had yeah. a guy like Paul Check on who is just a fucking wizard. Yeah. I mean, he is, he exemplifies total human optimization. Yeah. And uh, he came on the On It podcast to really talk about your your foundation, which is your body, yeah. you know, it's your mindset, it's how you treat it. What you put into your body has a dramatic impact on how you feel, how you think, what your emotional state is, how you sleep, all those things are a product of how you treat your body. Yeah. And then he went on Aubrey's, he talked about open relationship, he talked about yeah. love, he talked about God. Yeah. yeah, man, beautiful, beautiful. That's so cool. So it's cool, because it's more, it's not, I mean, it, it's, um, we're just we're fucking married, you know. Yeah. Like we got that thing going where yeah. it's 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 all it's all good, and and uh, you know he talks about uh, Don Howard's beautiful phrase "para bien del todos," uh -huh. you know, for the good of all, uh -huh. and that's what it is. You know, I see it as that. It's non-competitive. It's just like, hey man, and if I got a guy that's better for him, I throw him to Aubrey's way, and yeah. if he's got a guy that's you know a lot of people try to come on his show, and they're like, actually that that'd be a better fit for on it. Yeah. So I get a lot of good guests from Aubrey. Yeah. And then do you guys, oh, we talked about it a little bit, but do you guys fly people out there? or how? I mean, logistically. Yeah, that's one of the beautiful things because it's not L.A. You know, yeah. it's not like people are already in town. You know, let me get what, while you're in town. A couple times a year with South By and, and uh, ACL and things like that. But, um, or Paleo FX is big because a, a lot of health and wellness people are in town for, for the Onnit podcast. But um, it's nice that Onnit has, you know, they're a big company. They're yeah. doing big things. And it's kind of like I got towed in. Uh, on a surfboard into this giant wave and I get to ride it in with everybody yeah you know so we get to fly people out company pays for that put them up in a hotel to really roll out the red carpet for them yeah. and that was something Aubrey had spoken to me about as one of my unwritten jobs was like hey man I'm really busy I can't always be around to give people the honored experience yeah. would you be down and yeah. it's that's been awesome because now it's just it's not just I fly somebody in and podcast with them for an hour and a half I actually get to experience life with them you know take them out to the bar if that's what they want to do yeah. uh maybe drop in with some plants if that's what they want to do yeah. you know go out on the lake do different things and it, you really get to know somebody then you know because yeah, it's cool it's all the cool shit that happens off the mics too you know yeah that's really cool it just seems like such a cool my mental picture of it is just really cool you know what i mean like just getting to fly out there and like the way you guys do it and i've heard from some of the podcasts and stuff like you know, there's a gym there, right? Yeah, it's a just, fucking amazing gym. Yeah, like that whole environment. And just then you knock out a couple podcasts. Like, it's just cool. And just to me, really, like I told you before we started again, like, um, it's just you guys are doing a good job at sort of being the epitome of a well-done brand in 2018 that not only is doing a good job with the products that you're making and marketing them the right way, but then truly living it and the founder and you and you're just you truly are what the brand stands for and not only are you just walking around saying i'm truly what the brand stands for but you're actively putting out content supporting that you know what i mean yeah i think that's what it's become you know it started with alpha brain and you know most products i mean even new mood which is incredible for sleep that mm -hmm. started off as roll on roll off yeah. to cure molly hangovers uh -huh. from ecstasy <laughs> That's you know, so like funny. everything came out of necessity yeah you know and now it's different because we partnered with exos and they're a giant sports performance company mm -hmm. so that's cool because uh you know when i was a professional athlete that's shit that i cared about so i have that whole new new area to push towards supplement wise yep. but it's much bigger than a supplement company you know obviously we make kettlebells and things like that but it's a brand that wants to move the needle on everything that optimizes you yeah. you know like how can we live a little bit better each day than we did the day previous yeah. and when you think about that that's all the fucking things that's mm -hmm. that's health and wellness the physical that's your mental emotional and it is something spiritual it is you know what happens in these plant cer ceremonies mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and, and i think uh that's really cool to be a part of something where it's not just like yeah you can say that it's like no dude we're fucking down mm -hmm. like i'm going with aubrey and my wife and a bunch of people to don howard's spot in peru at mm -hmm. the end of next month for mm -hmm. wachuma what's and that wachuma is uh san pedro cactus it's similar to peyote but it's the south american version and um yeah you know i've never done it before so i can't speak on it too much but i, I like to refer people to the podcast that don howard did with aubrey marcus on the aubrey marcus podcast uh -huh. he really dives deep on it Something I've wanted to experience for a long time. We'll get to do three, three ceremonies every other day there for that, and then followed up by Vilca, which is 
completely out of body, like all in the death, same trip. death and rebirth. Yeah, really? it's a uh, it's a powder <laughs> you snort out of a three thousand year old shaman's finger, and uh, it's in this oh, giant man. abalone shell. Fuck. It's got NNDMT, five MeO DMT, and bufotenine, all psychedelic, and um, yeah, you, it's forty five. It lasts forty five minutes to an hour at the tail end of this Wachuma trip, yeah. but it's fucking blast off. So that will be. Uh, I'm sure we'll podcast about that. Yeah, after. you have to. Yeah, we're going to have to. Damn it. That is so freaking cool. And do you feel now like you're like in the ultimate sort of home on the right path, like you found the right spot? Everything's fucking clicking. Yeah, that's what you know? it feels like. And it's cool too because like there, when I first got to on it, having just lost my job the way that I did, there was panic. You know, like yeah. I wanted to, I got to show everybody how good I am. I got to fucking hit the ground running. I got to be the best. And I'm drinking a half half a pot of coffee a day. I'm trying to schedule everything in. Like I schedule a meditation at this time or that kind of thing. And it all sucked. Yeah. Meditation sucked when you're just trying to fucking cram it in cross to your schedule. Yeah, yeah. yeah, check off all the boxes, that kind of shit. And I went out to Spirit Ranch, this obvious little getaway in Sedona. And they do this caffeine detox for six days and you're out in the mountains and the energy there is palpable. Like you feel it. And um, I just realized like this, there was so much deep peace that I started crying, I realized like I haven't felt that in mm -hmm. fucking months. Mm -hmm. Like you can't, you can't get yourself jacked on stimulants, natural or not, mm -hmm. and then think you're gonna meditate your way back to baseline. Mm -hmm. Like there's a, you just can't get back down that far, yep. right? So having that really dialed me in, and I realized the importance of that, the importance of that piece to find. I mean, the piece of the equation for finding inner peace, yep. for for being able to touch that piece at least once every day, you know. How do you do that now? How do you apply that? I've got so many fucking methods that I love. Um, I don't stick to one every day. You know, sometimes I'll do the traditional 45 minute to an hour in the dark room. Yeah. Um, the ones that I've really gravitated towards recently are the things that I can do quickly that will shift me. Yeah. Uh, breath work has been amazing. You know, breath of fire where you're breathing in and out of your nose, belly breaths really quickly. Yeah. You can do that for three to five minutes and feel different. Uh -huh. You know, uh, Tai Chi, you know, Paul Check was big on that. He taught me these really dumbed down versions of Tai Chi and Qi Gong. And um, he has this at the end of his book. That was one of the books I was referring to where I was like, fuck all that, I don't need to read that. Yeah. It's in uh, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy by Paul Check, which is an excellent book. I recommend a lot of people. But at the end of that, he goes through these different zone exercises, which is like a breathwork squat. You exhale going down in the squat, you inhale coming back up. Uh -huh. And you do that for long enough, you fucking feel different. Yeah. You know, like Wim Hof says, feeling is believing. Yeah. Like when you start to shift yourself, internally and, and you can feel the difference i gravitate towards stuff like that yeah you know and it's quicker it's much quicker so at least once a day you're doing something like at that. at least once a day and if i can trickle it in like like pavel tatsulin talks about that greasing the groove mm -hmm. you don't have an hour for your workout do 10 push-ups every hour on the hour yeah at the end of the day you got 100 push-ups yeah right so that builds strength that trains the brain to the muscle well the same thing applies to meditation the same thing applies to breath work the same thing applies to Hot and cold therapies, which is something I've been getting into yep. as a recent. So, do you do like the cold shower, cold plunge, anything I'm, like that? I'm I'm a little past the cold shower. I got into the <laughs> Wim Hof method after hearing him on Rogan's and uh, Tim Ferriss's show, and I'd done some training out here in Malibu with uh, Gabby Reese and Laird Hamilton, and they're uh -huh. big into the contrast. Yep. But I was spending like forty to sixty bucks a day on ice, uh -huh. and that ended up quick. In and a then, bathtub? Yeah, in a, in like a horse trough that I got on Amazon. Yeah. And uh, Kelly Sturette, who wrote Becoming a Supple Leopard, he's been a good friend, um, fantastic book on mobility. He's dialed in all this. He actually got me in with the people at XPT with Gabby and Laird. Uh -huh. And he was like, dude, buy a chest freezer, like a meat freezer. You'd put extra meat in from a hunt. Uh -huh. And you fill it full of water, Epsom salt, and uh, hydrogen peroxide. And you lay in that thing. You only got to plug it in three days a week, and it stays between 30 and 50 degrees. Yeah. Problem solved. I've got an ice bath that I can use every single day, yeah. and it costs next to nothing. What a hack. Yeah, it's That's the best. So and everyone does that now. Ben Greenfield's into that. Like a lot of people that I follow in, whether it's the biohacking or health and wellness, or even from a meditation standpoint, um, we have this awesome guy on the show, Luke Story, uh -huh. who's out in LA. Uh -huh. And Luke's super dialed in on that stuff, but he's got different methods for the cold bath. But Everyone's doing that. It's 500 bucks, so it's a little investment, but if you compare that to like a $5,000 sauna, yeah. it's a tenth of the price. Yeah. And the benefits 
are everywhere. Yeah. Like it burns fat tremendously. Ferris talked about that in the four hour body. Yeah. So if your goal is weight loss, that's an excellent way to lose fat. Yeah. Um, changes the neurochemistry in your brain. You feel different coming out of it. Gives you energy. Resets the circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. So you sleep better at night. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it, it touches all levels. It's a hard one. I know I sound like such a wuss here, but like I've been working on, you know, I've been doing meditation slowly over the years and then been working uh, working out a little bit more and doing all this different stuff, but damn it, that cold, freezing cold. I haven't adjusted to that one yet. Man. It took my wife a little bit. She's yeah, about half, hard. literally half my size. She weighs a buck 15. Yeah. Just finished yoga teacher training. and uh, But, you know, she's paper thin, shredded. Mm -hmm. And so she gets in there, but, you know, it's everything that you do in life no matter what your priority is, consistency wins. Yep. You know, being consistent with it, uh, whether that's training, whether that's sticking to a diet and eating good food, that matters mm -hmm. how often you stick to it. Mm -hmm. And so getting in that cold bath, even if you can just do 30 seconds on day one, mm -hmm. you'll get 45 seconds or a minute day two. Mm -hmm. And over time, you'll build up to five minutes. Yeah. You don't have to go much past that if it's freezing temperature. Yeah. What did you get thrown off a lot when you travel, or did you figure out like hacks and stuff for that? You got to figure that shit out. Yeah. You know, I like to get out in nature. Uh, I'm barefoot half the time just so I can get grounded, um, which sounds fucking weird. But there's <laughs> there's some science that shows that we should be connected to yeah. the earth. Yeah. Um, there's a great book by Wallace J. Nichols on um, on the ocean, on just mm -hmm. being by water. You yeah. know, getting in the water, how that shifts our neurochemistry, but you know, things like that. If I'm not flying to Cal, like I fly to California, first thing I'm doing is getting in the water. Yeah. Um, but really like figuring out where can I eat that's not gonna fuck me up. Yeah. You know, Chipotle isn't the best food, but it's miles better than McDonald's or some yeah. of these other places. Yeah. And if I can afford, I'll stay in an Airbnb, then I can just run to Whole Foods, grab some good organic food and make it myself. Yeah. You know, having yeah. good snacks like sardines and macadamia nuts, things that are higher fat, lower carb, which is dialed for my, my type of eating. Yeah. That's the best way to do it. Um, what do you, what would you say was like your biggest eye opening kind of taking it back a little bit to like getting into lear learning all this stuff and really taking it to the next level. Right. Cause this is where it gets into like, I myself grew up with none of this. I grew up skateboarding and in Akron, Ohio, and my parents didn't really care that much about health or that sort of stuff. Right. So like literally zero foundation of any of this. And I feel like now, you know, mine's probably started in the last slowly over the last few years um but it just seems like everything like there's this whole new world right there's all mm -hmm. these new things and this is so great and you can feel better and you can and it's just like most people are like yeah no shit but i guess my what i'm getting at is what was the first biggest like misconception that changed for you would you say it was like the meditation type stuff and the more spiritual stuff the first thing that planted the seed in fighting was when i read how to eat move and be healthy i did an elimination diet mm -hmm. so no grain no dairy those kind of things i added back in uh, bread and it fucked me up. I couldn't breathe out of my nose. I was farting like crazy. And I was yeah. like, fuck dude, I'm gluten intolerant. Yeah. And that's not the case for everybody, but for me it was a big deal. It felt like this, I'd been wearing this weight vest my whole life and I finally took it off. Yeah. And now I could feel when I put the weight vest back on. Uh -huh. And that planted the seed for me to want to learn more about diet specifically. Cause I was like, if that one fucking change meant that much to me, what does adding in a supplement that benefits me or making a different change that's maybe less noticeable than that yeah. do for me, yeah. right? And um, and then at a certain point, like as far as my desire to be consistent and do what's best for me, because I still want fucking pizza, uh -huh. I still want to drink, I still want to do these things, right? Is there a better way to do it? You know, that came from an ayahuasca ceremony I did right after I retired from fighting. Mm -hmm. And it showed me this parallel of how I would fight is I would be perfectly clean for eight weeks, no alcohol, no drugs, meditate every day, read, not even watch shitty TV, and then I'd fight. And after the fight, I was like, I've been a good boy for eight weeks, yeah. let's celebrate. Yeah. Drink, do blow, fucking eat bad food, yeah. and, and fucking watch shitty TV, and not <laughs> meditate once, and not read a damn book. Yeah. You know, And it showed me that parallel, and I could feel it in my body, the difference in how I felt. It would shift from, I feel like fucking King Kong or Hercules or fill in the blank yeah. to I feel miserable and sick and I can't move. Yeah. Like it would draw back and forth and it did it enough where I was like, okay, I fucking get it, I get it. I don't need to fight yeah. to live in a way that serves me, mm -hmm. you know? And then from there, um, there was a cool hashtag from Quest Nutrition, Cheat Clean. Mm -hmm. And that stuck with me because it's like, yeah, man, I can make my own fucking ice cream with coconut cream. Yeah. I can do different things that are 
that are beneficial for me so I don't feel like I'm missing out on life. Yeah. I mean, even alcohol. We interviewed this guy, uh, Todd White, the CEO of Dry Farm Wines. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard of them, but no. there's a ton of people in health and wellness that support these guys. Rob Wolf, uh, Dr. Kirk Parsley, Dominic D'Agostino, like guys that I look up to that I want to interview or have interviewed. Yeah. And um, it's an all-organic wine, and it's there's there's no ad added chemicals, nothing in it. Yeah. And so you, the, the thing is, you can drink this wine and not be hungover. Does it work? It fucking works. Really? I'd read about it. And I was like, man, I don't know. I'm not a big wine guy. Fuck. And uh, like you, you know, got I, wasted on. I got fucked up. I got, I got fucking. I pushed. I pushed the envelope with that. Like, <laughs> yeah, of course was, you did. You know, yeah. and I was great the next day. Yeah. You know, and I got, and it's different now with a kid. Our kid's three. He's a ball of light, ball of energy. Mm -hmm. And at six a.m., I got to be on point. Yeah. I can't be hungover. I can't be a piece of shit that's like, oh, you know, watch iPad or do this thing. You know, <laughs> hang out with yourself. Yeah. You know, I got to show up as dad. Yeah. And um, that's been a big determinant also for me to really, you know, I like pushing the envelope with plants and things like that. Certainly, like when we go to the Amazon next month, uh, my family will be watching our son. So mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about that. I can kind of check out and push, push the envelope there. But when it comes to all these other things, the daily practices of like, all right, you know, I want to celebrate tonight. We're at a wedding. Like there's a right way and a wrong way to do everything. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. figuring out what that looks like, I think that's been the thing that's most desirable for me right yeah. now. Do you still do any sort of cheat? Like, do you have a cheat schedule or it's just based around whatever circumstances? I think if I'm in a certain spot, like we're here in LA, I might hit Vito's yeah. sometime on this trip. Yeah. This is my favorite fucking pizza on earth. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll deal with that. But I mean, for the most part, I don't do one cheat meal a week. I don't do, you know, people have this 80 20 rule. I think that's crap because yeah. that ends up becoming like, I eat clean all day, I'll have a bad dinner. Yeah. you know and yeah. that doesn't work that doesn't work that's how you get fat and really i feel it with inflammation in my body like yeah. all the old injuries come back when yeah. i eat like shit that's interesting and that's probably the most important thing is it's not just this i know i'm in shape i know i can afford to gain five pounds of fat but i try to teach people like this concept that it's not just the weight gain from the cheat meal. Yeah. It's how you think. It's how you move. Yeah. It's how you feel. It's how you operate in the world. It's your emotional status. It's how you sleep that night. You got to pay for all that. Yeah. You know, and what you're putting into your body has a direct correlation with all those things. Yeah. What do you think is like the biggest thing that people miss? Like, is there anything that when you look at just the normal population, you're like, man, is there any one thing or is it just I think realistic? I don't think the ketogenic diet, which is high carb, low or high fat, low carb, is dead right for everyone yeah. you know but i think it lowering carbohydrates for the masses yeah. is probably a good idea yeah. um for cognitive function so you're not on that roller coaster of fuck i just ate two hours ago and i'm starving yeah. you know or um you know people want to lose weight people that are overweight they're probably insulin resistant mm -hmm. you know they probably could take some time doing intermittent fasting or taking a break for three months out of the year with carbohydrates mm -hmm. before refrigeration and before shipping, you know, most people on this earth, unless you lived on the equator, went without carbs for at least a few months a year, mm -hmm. right? So creating that metabolic flexibility has been huge for me. I mean, that was a big thing when I stopped fighting. I got into the ketogenic diet and um, I felt like my brain turned on yeah. for the first time in fucking decades. Yeah. You know, body pain went down. I could eat when I wanted, but I wasn't drawn to it. And I, it really gave me like this feeling like I was in control over what I put in my body. Yeah. You know, I think, and you know, it doesn't, it's not the diet for everyone. And it's certainly not the diet that you do for the rest of your life. I'm not in ketosis year round, yeah. but that's been a fucking game changer. Yeah. Absolutely. And also where would you recommend, like, cause it sounds to me like one of the biggest things about this is just sort of this like discovery and then trying different things and finding out what works the best for you. Right. Yeah. And like, where's the best source of this information for people? I got a ton of books. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Do you have like a reading list or anything? Uh, put I up? don't. I should put one together. That's a good idea. I, you I'll really have, should. I'll have Aubrey's assistant do that. Yeah, for you me. got to, man. Because then you could just say like, "Go here," blah blah blah. But I tell Aubrey's you wanna... assistant that he's half my assistant. Cause <laughs> yeah. I fuck with that guy a lot. I'm sure. But, uh, my buddy Ian. Um, yeah, Wired to Eat by Rob Wolf. It, you know, he touches on the ketogenic diet, but more importantly, if you're going to eat carbs, what's right for you, right? So a lot of times we hear like brown rice is good, white rice is good, uh, quinoa is good, but everyone reacts differently. So Rob Wolf does this carbohydrate test where you have 50 grams of carbs each day in the morning, pre-workout, pre-anything else, and you test your blood sugar pre and post. Uh -huh. And you do that. It's a little bit of a hassle, but you can find out very quickly 
like, hey, I'm good with bananas, but I'm not good with white rice. Mm -hmm. I can eat sweet potato, but I can't eat white potato. Yeah. And what that means is, it doesn't mean I'll never eat white rice again. White rice fucks me up. I look pre-diabetic with my blood sugar when I have that. But I damn sure better have worked out that day if I'm gonna eat it, right? So yeah. if I go to a Thai restaurant and I know like, man, I'm, in, I'm back in the Bay and my brother-in-law has a Thai restaurant, I wanna hit it up. I'm gonna work out hard that day so yeah. I don't suffer for it. Yeah. You know, and then other carbohydrates like sweet potatoes, I can get away with a whole plate of those and not have any issues. So yeah. that means less inflammation, less cognitive dysfunction, like all these things play a factor. Yeah. So you, it really helps you fine tune. Uh, the Keto Reset Diet is an excellent book. I've read a lot of books on the ketogenic diet. Uh -huh. That's by Mark Sisson. So people have questions about that. I usually refer them to that book. Uh, Complete Guide to Fasting by Dr. Jason Fung and Jimmy Moore. Mm -hmm. Excellent resource on that. But uh, as far as cold, like getting into breath work, getting into cold training, yoga, things like that, uh, Wim Hof Method at WimHofMethod.com. Yeah. So they do a 10-week online course. I think it's only a couple hundred bucks, but that was a fucking game changer for me. Really? Absolute game changer. And it's only one form of breath work, but it's it's a pretty important one. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of science that supports what he's doing now. They're studying him. They studied him in Europe. They're studying him at Harvard now. And they just, you know, they're literally scratching the tip of the iceberg with this guy. Yeah. Like he's he's moving a lot of, making a lot of waves when it yeah, comes gotta to Yeah, I got to do that. I got to do that course. Because I've listened to those podcasts and stuff like that. And it's it's been fascinating, but I have never dove into it. And it's just like everyone that talks about it that has really done it has been changed by it. Yeah, you know what I mean? completely. There's only completely. so many times you can hear that when you're like, okay, <laughs> I'm just not doing something. Yeah. Um, man, how interesting. What, um, where do you see going from here? Like, do you see just continuing to like explore and to better everything that you're doing? I mean, like I said, you, you feel like you're going to be on it for a long time, right? Yeah, no, there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, the more podcasts you do, the more you learn from these great people yeah. and it kind of lines shit up. You know, you meet a great guy and they plant three more seeds. I was hanging with Kyle Tierman, who's a big wave surfer and environmentalist, yeah. and he connected me with a ton of great guys, you know, and, and uh, you know, and I've done the same for him and it, and it just kind of works that way and yeah. you continue to learn, continue to grow. And then really, like Paul Chick told me this too, because he saw these books on my desk. He's like, the guy who reads everything and applies nothing is the smartest guy in the room that hasn't done shit. Yeah. Like it means nothing, right? You haven't, if you don't ground that into your experience, it's not real wisdom, yep. you know? So it's, it's applying these things, seeing what sticks that really matters to me and then sharing that as much as possible. Yep. You know, I think that's, that's the direction I'm heading and, um, you know, continue to do that with all things, with different types of training, uh, different supplements that we can create and use and certainly, different forms of meditation, breath work, um, anything that connects us to our bodies that we can really feel. And yeah. certainly the thing that I found that people enjoy the most because everyone's fucking pressed for time. Yeah. You know, what can I fit into a five minute window that'll actually help me, that yeah. I'll feel, yeah. you know? And I think that's where breath work really stands out. Yeah. Let me ask you this. This is a big, like powerful ending question. If you could like you've evolved through so many different stages and learned so much stuff and literally essentially learned for a living now. If you could go back and tell that younger version of yourself that was fighting and, you know, whatever, uh, if you could tell yourself anything to kind of take the edge off or not, you know, make things a little bit easier, what would you tell that version of yourself? Hmm. Breathe deeply and trust that everything will work out. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Because if I gave more than that, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. Yeah. You know? That's if I, so true. If the young me had ayahuasca, it'd be a completely different fucking path. Yeah. Wouldn't have the same wife. Wouldn't Because we had to meet at the right time. Yeah. You know, we had to meet at the right time and be in the place we were both at for it to work. Yeah. You know, we've grown together because of the plans, because of our willingness to grow and learn, but also... Um, everything happened perfectly yeah. you know and yeah. i think that there's beauty that's one of the things you learn in the psychedelic experience is yeah. the appreciation for all of it there is no up without down there's no fat without thin there's yeah. no hot without cold there's no good without bad and if you don't experience that that bad like half the time you go through those things in the moment you have blinders on you're like this fucking sucks yeah. this is the worst thing ever i can't recover from this yeah. and you know however much time passes you look back on that and you're like that was fucking beautiful. Yeah. I needed that thing. That was the catalyst for change, for growth. Yeah. That stressor 
made me a better person. Yeah. yeah that's true. Um, where do people find you? I'm at Kings Boo on Twitter, Instagram. Um, you can follow me at, at on it. So at on it on all social media as well. I do a lot of shit through through their social channels. Yeah. On it podcast. That's the big one. Yeah. Is that just if you search O N N I T on yep. Apple on everywhere? Yeah, on everywhere. Yep. On everywhere. And um Yeah, that's about it, brother. Those are the spots. Man, thanks for doing this. Fuck yeah, thanks thank for you for having me. Story. Yeah. Thanks for giving some knowledge. This was great. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Guys, if you like that and you want to see more like it as well as vlogs, other web series, and all the random stuff that I'm doing here on YouTube, don't forget to click that subscribe button. You won't regret it. I promise.